mighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Dear friends, today we observe Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of the Christian year, which means that next Sunday is our new year. This observance, which is also called by some of our Christian brothers and sisters as the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, or the Feast of Christ the King, is a recent addition to the Western liturgical calendar. It was instituted in 1925 by Pope Pius XI for the Roman Rite of the Roman Catholic Church on the last Sunday in October, the Sunday before the Feast of All Saints. In 1970, its Roman Rite observance was moved to the final Sunday of Ordinary Time, just before the first Sunday of Advent. The Feast of Christ the King has an end time dimension to it, pointing to the end of time when the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be established in all its fullness to the ends of the earth. The Christian year is cyclic, and it leads into Advent, this Sunday of Christ the King, when the church anticipates Christ's second coming. In establishing the Feast of Christ the King, Pope Pius XI wrote, if to Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all of us, purchased by his precious blood, are by a new right subject to his dominion, if this power embraces all of us, it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. Christ must reign in our minds, which should assent with perfect submission and firm belief to revealed truths and the doctrines of Christ. Christ must reign in our wills, which should obey the laws and the precepts of God. He must reign in our hearts, which would spurn natural desires and love God above all things and cleave to God alone. He must reign in our bodies, which would serve as instruments for the interior sanctification of our souls, or, to use the words of the Apostle Paul, as instruments of, God, of justice unto God. This Sunday acts as a final chapter to 52 weeks of looking at the person of Jesus Christ, to his story. And Jesus asks us on this last day, so, who do you say that I am? The texts for this day across three years help us to answer the question, perhaps, but the gospel text for this year is not one that is either easy to hear or easy to preach. However, I think it's more appropriate for where we find ourselves, living in America, only days after a presidential election. Let me explain. As we hear the passage from Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter, verses 31 to 46, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? or naked and gave you clothing? Or when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, 
Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or naked or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Not something you would want to hear, possibly, from a Hallmark story, but one that I think ultimately leads us to Jesus' question for us today. Who do you say that I am? This passage is from the final days of the earthly ministry of Jesus, shortly before his crucifixion and resurrection. This futuristic tale of sheep and goats is perhaps the most unsettling of all in the scripture corpus. It is, in, it is Jesus who offers us a searing vision of what Jesus regards as the ultimate decider of who is in and who is out. What it is that does indeed separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. It is hardness of heart in the face of relievable human misery, according to this parable. What is so striking about this already striking passage is the insight it offers as to what it is that puts us outside of Jesus' ministry, what it is that ultimately separates us from God, and what causes us to be goats rather than sheep and send us ultimately into damnation. Perhaps. Was it that they failed to recite the correct creeds? Was it their theology that was unsound? Was their view of the inspiration of scripture not high enough? Did they decline with a list of excuses when Jesus said, come and follow me? And what about the sheep? What was it that saved them? Did they respond enthusiastically when Jesus called with, here I am, Lord? Did they have sound theology? Perhaps an intimate nature of our, or rote memorization of orthodox creeds. Maybe it was an uncompromising conviction shared with those who will listen, with those who won't, that the Bible is the inerrant and unfailable word of God. Well, according to the parable, the answer is simple. And the answer is no. And what is absolutely staggering is that neither the sheep nor the goats have any idea what they are doing when they do it. Jesus stood right in front of them, and they didn't know it. Neither sheep nor goats recognized Jesus who he was, as it were, standing right there in front of them. You'll notice that both of them asked the same question. Lord, when was it when we saw you? The response is a response to life which is solely about love. And it's certainly not about trying to somehow earn an eternal reward by our own actions. Salvation is not something that we can earn. These acts of compassion, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, visiting those in prison are all acts of compassion which come to us as our calling, our vocation, as the result of our baptism into the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This vocation is countercultural, and it flies directly in the face of everything that we hear from secular American culture. I've seen during these last months, this last year, something very disconcerting to me as a Christian, as one who claims the name of Jesus and who feebly attempts to walk in the way of Jesus Christ. I've seen it in many people, some of them family and some of them friends, many of them claiming the name of Jesus, but who refuse to take seriously the care of those who are hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison. 
They live in a world where in the name of God, money has become the real king, and their worldview is about the opposition to anything that is not centered in a world of white heterosexual male power, the world of power and control. This gospel, this good news, bears nothing in common with our calling that we hear in the gospel today. And it has come to be called the gospel of prosperity, prosperity gospel here in this country. Prosperity gospel, the health and the wealth gospel, the gospel of success, the gospel of seed faith, is a religious belief among many Protestant Christians that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith and positive speech and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. It's been criticized by leaders from various Christian denominations, including within the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements, who maintain that it's irresponsible. It promotes idolatry, and it's contrary to scripture. Secular, as well as some Christian observers, have also criticized this prosperity theology as exploitive of the poor. The practices of some preachers have attracted scandal, and some have been charged with financial fraud. Prosperity theology views the Bible as a contract between God and humans. If humans have faith in God, God will deliver security and prosperity to them. This doctrine emphasizes the importance of personal empowerment, proposing that it is God's will for all of God's people to be blessed. The atonement, the reconciliation with God, is interpreted to include the alleviation of sickness and poverty, which are viewed as curses only to be broken by faith. This is believed to be achieved through donations of money, by visualization, by positive confession. It came about during the healing revivals of the 1950s that prosperity theology first became prominent in this country, although commentators have linked the origins of its theology to the New Thought movement of the last century. The prosperity teaching later figured prominently in the Word of Faith movement. It came about in the 1980s through televangelism, and in the 1990s and 2000s, it was adopted by influential leaders in the Pentecostal movement and the charismatic movement in the United States, and it spread throughout the world. This is the brand of gospel that unfortunately sells too often in this country. I fear greatly, my friends, for those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who see this version of Jesus and are repulsed rather than being drawn to him. I think, my friends, we have lots of work to do in this world. We must be able to see Jesus in every human being, not just those we want to see him in, and to reach out in compassion to meet their needs. We must become icons of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, my dear friends, on this Sunday, and in fact every moment, Jesus says to us, Who do you say that I am? Will the people outside of these walls, in a hurting and broken world, see and know by our actions on Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, the answer that we have to Jesus' question to us today? He comes to us, and he says to us, who do you say that I am? Amen. And amen. Let us pray. Through baptism we have been raised with Christ, ordained into a royal priesthood, and made citizens of a holy nation. As faithful priests serving the King of Kings, let us intercede for all the world, saying, In the name of Jesus our Sovereign, hear our prayer. Almighty God, Sovereign Majesty, as your humble priest, we pray today for all your children who do not confess you as Lord. Enable us to live the good news convincingly that all may inherit eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, ruler of the nations, cause the leaders of the nations to recognize your sovereignty and to accept your gracious rule. Make them proponents of peace and lovers of justice. Crown each ruler with compassion 
that all people may live in peace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, merciful monarch, look with pity on all who suffer, those with incurable disease, those with COVID, those unjustly imprisoned, those that are denied dignity, the hungry, those without shelter, those who live without hope. Direct us toward them that their royalty may be reclaimed and their lives celebrate your grace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, Lord of the church, we pray for your holy Catholic church on earth. Grant that all who bear the name of Christ into one vigorous, fruitful community of faith, that the world may see one King of glory and one kingdom of grace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, benevolent judge, we pray for your, all your people gathered here to seek your grace. By your mercy, prepare us for the day of judgment that we may accept it as a rich and royal gift for the eternal pleasure of the faithful. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, hear our prayer. Grant these our petitions, O God, according to your perfect will, that your holy name may be praised and proclaimed until that day when all the faithful shall gather before your throne in heaven through the merits of Jesus Christ, our sovereign and Lord. Amen. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>